Hey guys, welcome back. Uh, this sermon is entitled, You Don't Have To. Uh, it's as simple as that. You don't have to do this. And uh, <clears throat> this uh, sermon actually came off of um, a moment after Lent where I had went 40 days with just water, you know, skipped out a lot of sugars, uh, dropped quite a bit of weight. Um, and the moment I got done with Easter, I cracked open my Mountain Dew. I uh, had an excessive amount of crap that I just hadn't had in the last 40 days. I started to overindulge in unnecessary sugar intake. And not sure if anyone else has ever done anything like that, right? You go on a diet and you do pretty good. And then all of a sudden you're like, oh, it's a cheat day. And it becomes a cheat month. And you feel like crap and you swell back up like you're allergic to bees. Um, but I'm not. But anyway, uh, this sermon was written, you know, right out of uh, Easter time. So... With that thought process in mind, we moved into the scripture of what the disciples did right after Jesus had died. Uh, he'd rose again, and then they didn't see him. They didn't know what to do. And we get into our scripture today, which is John chapter 21, verses 1 through 3. So later, Jesus appeared again to the disciples beside the Sea of Galilee. This is how it happened. Several of the disciples were there, Simon, Peter, Thomas, nicknamed the twin, Nathaniel from Cana and Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two other disciples. Simon Peter said, I'm going fishing. We'll come too, they all said. So they went out in the boat, but they caught nothing all night. Lord had a blessing, the reading of his word. Now there's a lot more to that sermon, uh, a lot more to that scripture, and you'll hear parts of it in the restored second part of this series. Um, but who is the guy that decides to go fishing. If you listen to me when I just read that scripture, who said, hey, I'm going to go fishing? It was Peter. Now, I want you to think about the things that had happened to Peter right up until this moment. Over the last couple of days, even. Peter had a lot of stuff going through his mind. You know, weeks prior, we have Palm Sunday. Okay, so... You have Peter right there with Jesus when all of Jerusalem, millions of people are praising Messiah, Messiah, Messiah. A huge high. The world recognizes who Jesus is and Peter's right there. Then you have the Last Supper where Jesus washes his disciples' feet. Hours after, you know, I mean, we're talking not hours, but days after, everyone recognized him as the king. Now Jesus is showing himself as the lowliest. He washes Peter's feet. Peter says, no, you'll never wash mine. And Jesus says, if I don't wash your feet, you can't be part of me. So he's like, then wash my whole body. So Peter's all over here. Then you have Judas's betrayal, the night of, where they come into the garden and Peter is ready. He had just at that supper, Jesus tells Peter, you're going to deny me three times. I'll never deny you, Peter says. I'll go to the death for you. And you have that scene in the garden where they come to arrest Jesus. Peter pulls out his sword, cuts off Malchus's ear. He's ready to fight and die for him. And Jesus says, Peter, put the sword away. Those that live by the sword, die by the sword. And then heals Malchus's ear. Jesus is arrested. Peter doesn't know what to do. He's ready to fight for him and to die for him. So he follows Jesus. He sees Jesus in the courtyard, said he'd never deny him, just got in a fight, and then sitting in that courtyard, not once, not twice, but three times, two in front of women, don't know who the third person was other than it was a gatekeeper, three times, says, I never knew Jesus, goes as far as saying, curse me if I'm lying, I never knew this man. Hmm. Now, I spoke heavily in a prior sermon on Monday, Thursday about Peter or, Jews, uh, Peter or Judas, how both of them denied Jesus and betrayed Jesus. Judas took things into his own hands and ended his own life, became his own judge, jury, and executioner. Peter, on the other hand, was still reeling in all of his guilt. Because remember where we're at, this isn't far after the resurrection of Jesus. And Peter doesn't know how to handle all of this. He can't, he can't accept who is this. I mean, what should I do? How should I act for Jesus? I said I'd fight for him. He didn't want that. Then I denied him. I said I loved him, but I lied about it. And he just didn't know how to handle it. 
Then Peter shows up in John's gospel, sees that Jesus was resurrected, and he believes it. Peter knew that Jesus was the Messiah, and at this moment he starts to understand the scriptures. Peter got it. And he got it when they were all in that locked room and Jesus showed up. When he saw the linen wrapped up on the tomb, Peter knew this was the Messiah. But at this point, he doesn't know what to do. He gets that Jesus is the Messiah, but he doesn't know how to act. He doesn't know what life to live. And he's reeling in this guilt and he's dealing with this shame and he's just torn apart. So let me ask you this question as we switch gears. Maybe you can relate to it in a mildly different form. Have you ever been in trouble when you were a kid by your parents? Or maybe now as an adult where you really screwed up at work and you have to go stand before the boss? You know that feeling? Maybe when you were a kid of where you wrecked the car and you had to tell mom and dad or you lied or you got busted? And that feeling inside of guilt, maybe you're scared, you're ashamed, you're worried about how your parents will react to you because you really messed up. Peter feels that times 10. He now knows without a doubt that Jesus is the Messiah, that he has resurrected himself from the dead. And he heard all the stuff of Jesus saying, if you deny me before men, I will deny you before the Father. Peter's dealing with that, that guilt and that shame. So he decides to go back to what he thinks is normal. He runs. He goes to fishing. He gets in the boat. Because he probably figures, you know, this is me interpreting. I don't know. Scripture doesn't say this. This is just me in my mind reading into the story more. He probably feels, well, if I get back on the boat and I fish, I can't hurt Jesus anymore. I can't mess up there. Peter goes to a safe place. He goes back to that old normal before Jesus. He's with his friends who screwed up as well, and they're going to go back to that normal. Probably figure, well, we can't screw up and mess up any worse. We'll go back to that old lifestyle. Now, let's be honest here. How many times have you done that in your walk with Jesus? Have you done that same thing like Peter did? You're like, I can't follow this, Jesus. I'm not good enough. And you just go back into that old sinful lifestyle. You tried the Jesus thing and it was just too hard. You messed up. You're not good enough. You can't be the perfect Christian. You can't be 100% loyal to Jesus. You're a failure. And you can't handle the shame and guilt. So what do you do? You run back to your old, normal, pre-Jesus lifestyle. What you think is your safe place. Let's change gears here. Remember how in my intro I spoke about kind of, I called it a Lenten coma, where like I had given up so much stuff and then I uh, only had water and I was just pounding the sugar and drinking the Mountain Dew. And now it doesn't take anything for me to suddenly come up with an excuse to grab a pop instead of drinking water. I drive by my buddy's place, Bar Groves. You ever want to go, uh, Jason, Justice Barger, we got a farm, they got a fridge in their barn. It's always full of Mountain Dew. I just help myself to it. It's free. Go by Quick Trip. I'll get my Voltage Mountain Dew mix. Boys and I went turkey hunting. Two boys shot a couple uh, jakes. Could have grabbed a glass of water, but I wanted to get back to the birds, so I just grabbed a pop. It was easier. Easier. going back to that old lifestyle. It's easier to give in. Now, I had just went through Atlanta almost 50 days with no pop. I'd shown myself that I could only drink water and I felt a lot better. It was good for me. I had more energy. Uh, My back felt better. My whole health overall was improving. I'd lost weight. How does this relate to our Christian walk? How does this relate to Peter in the boat? We know that following Christ is better for us. 
sure has a lot better, not only in this life, but in the next life results. Just like me drinking water. Just because I can have a pop, just because it tastes good, because it's easy, because it's convenient, doesn't mean that I should. Just because Peter could go fishing doesn't mean that he should have. It was easier for him to run from work. I'm sorry, it was easier for him to run from God's work. And we probably think, well, if we're not working for Jesus, well, then we can't screw up. We can't fail him. But how far is that from the truth? When Jesus comes into our life, he is there to give us a new normal. That's why it says, away with the old and in with the new. I've made you a new creation. And suddenly, we get to have a choice. Will we continue to follow after Jesus or will we go back to that old lifestyle? Just like me choosing to have a pop. I can drink pop. It's there. It's not as good for me as water. We can follow Jesus. You can go back to that old lifestyle of sin. It's not good for you. It isn't great for your health benefits. It isn't good for your mental health, your spiritual health to reject Jesus. So now the question is, for you and for me, what are we going to choose? Think about your soul. I've talked about our body, now let's go about our soul. What is better for your soul? I'll give you two scenarios. Following Jesus, even when it's hard, or following the world. Which one's better for your soul? following Jesus. What about this one? Going to church or fishing on Sunday? There's a lot of you guys out there that might be watching this. You'll be like, oh, I'm going fishing. It's better for my soul. Be practical. Maybe funny. You need that moment with Jesus. You need that time. And I'll even concede here. If you're out on that boat and you're reading your Bible and you're praising God and you got 50 other people with you, go ahead. You can go have your boat church together get 50 other people to praise with you to worship with you how about this question what's better for your soul to have a relationship full of failures with Jesus or a successful relationship with Satan in this world which one's going to be better You don't have to give in to the world. You don't have to run from Jesus. Even though you failed and you're going to fail again, keep on that track of following after Jesus. Don't go back to that old lifestyle. Don't be like Peter and hop in the boat and go fishing. Keep trying to follow Jesus even when you mess up. You want to know what happened to Peter after he quits running from Jesus? When he realizes he doesn't have to run anymore, he realizes he doesn't have to fish anymore? Well, keep watching all our sermons and you can hear the second half, the next sermon entitled Restored. Keep running from Jesus. You don't have to anymore. It's not good for your soul. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for your word and we thank you for your scripture and how it uh, reminds us that Peter was just like us and it reminds us that we don't have to run from you even though we fail and we mess up. You give us another chance. Lord, I pray for each person here that they will uh, they'll quit trying to live that old lifestyle. And that even though they fail, they'll attempt to follow you. All this in Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. Thank you guys. Have a wonderful week. And don't forget, give each other a little grace. See ya. Hey guys, thanks for watching our videos. Once again, we really appreciate it. Uh, If you enjoy it, you know the whole drill. Click, like, subscribe, whatever you gotta do uh, so that as soon as our videos are out, you can see what we have. We really appreciate it. Thanks, have a great day.